Okay, so uh, good. So people are coming in. Thanks, Jay. Great. Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. It's great to have you all here. Thanks for uh, coming for this special uh, CPD today. Uh, as you know, this is a, a NIMI CPD, Neuroimaging and Mental Illness CPD. Uh, but our talk today is not going to be focused on neuroimaging. It's much broader and much uh, far-reaching talk. Uh, we are fortunate to have Dr. Jay Shah. Uh, Jay is an Associate Professor of Psychiatry at the Faculty of Medicine at McGill in Montreal. Uh, he's also the Associate Director of uh, the Prevention and Early Intervention Program, the PEP program in Montreal. Uh, well, it's a sister program. Well, I think I can say it's a, a French-speaking cousin program uh, for our PEP program. Uh, so, it's an uh, offspring. <laughs> it's an offspring. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, so he's also an FRSQ uh, clinician scientist at Douglas Hospital uh, Research Center. Uh, Jay has been deeply involved in, uh, and committed to early intervention efforts in psychosis and also in youth mental health. Uh, his focus is on uh, transdiagnostic shifts in early stage of mental health difficulties and the implications of such a shift for the uh, structure and function of services that we offer for young people. He leads and contributes to a range of research projects across neurobiological, clinical, and services research as well, including a CHR a Network Catalyst grant on youth mental health. Uh, he's very interested in economic evaluations of uh, service innovations um, and he uh, leads the economic uh, arm of the Access Open Minds program, um, and also uh, is an important partner in a 27-site international pro-net initiative funded by NAMH, focused on uh, youth mental health and early psychosis. So he's trained in medicine, health policy, economics, bioethics, and genetics before coming to psychiatry. I think uh, very few people can claim uh, such a wide expertise, Jay, so we're very pleased to, to have you. Uh, just one more point to add to that, uh, some of you might have already seen, uh, Jay recently led a very nice consensus on uh, clinical staging within psychiatry. I published it in the uh, World Psychiatry uh, a year ago. So I hope uh, some of his talk will touch upon uh, the staging program as well. Without much further ado, I will uh, open the floor for Jay. Please remember we're recording this session. Uh, so uh, please uh, make sure that you are in your best behavior. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. Over to you, Jay. Thank, thanks, Lena, and um, thank you for both for the warm welcome as well as the uh, friendly warning to be on my best behavior. That's not usually an issue, but we'll see if that holds here today. And I'm looking forward not just to the talk, but but also um, <clears throat> the opportunity to have an engaging discussion. Um, Lena, you, you know yourself, you're a bit of a polymath as well. You have a number of interests, you know, both the imaging piece, obviously but also um, things like DUP and phenomenology. And we've had a number of conversations over the years and I'm looking forward to more of those too. And this is a nice opportunity to continue that. And of course, I'm um, especially you know, delighted really to, to be able to talk with some of the folks uh, at Western who have known of and hosted PEP, what we call in Montreal, we call it PEP London, but it's really the original PEP, the OG PEP, I guess, as my kids might say. Um, uh, to which we're deeply indebted, and to its founders, Ross Norman uh, and Ashok Mala, who, who eventually migrated to, to Montreal and founded PEP Montreal here. So there is, um, there is certainly a familial connection, and um, it's nice to see these conversations continue to, to proceed. So thank you again. Um, so right, looking forward to talking today, and, and the talk will be sort of rooted in a lot of stuff that I have done and been thinking about and that my team and collaborators have, have contributed to in early psychosis, but also thinking more conceptually about the implications of what we've learned uh, and some core concepts uh, for not just early psychosis and the structure and function of services, but, but indeed across youth mental health. And there are some important lessons here that that I think the field as a whole is in, in the process of starting to think about translating. And that too is sort of, it's an exciting time to be doing this kind of stuff. I will, um, there are a few sections in the talk. So, so if it's okay with everyone, I will try and do my best to pause kind of at the end of each subsection and maybe see if anyone has questions. And if not, we can keep going. If so, we can maybe spend a couple of minutes there 
either clarifying things or having a discussion. And of course, I hope there will be time uh, towards the end as, as well to, to, to connect about broader issues too. All right, so let's get going. This is my disclosure statement. I have some grants and I have my Clinician Scientist Award from, from FRQS, which is the government of Quebec, so the Provincial Health Research Funding Agency, but, but no speakers, bureau, consulting fees or patents. And I'm affiliated with McGill and the Douglas Hospital and a couple of infrastructures therein, that being PEP, as well as Access Open Minds. And so, you know, I, I had initially um, put this title together, which was moving beyond categorical diagnoses in youth mental health, and that's certainly true. But the subtitle was Towards Transdiagnostic Clinical Staging. And then, of course, what happened was as I was putting the talk together, I thought, ah, maybe the title should be something a little more relevant to early psychosis since that's um, kind of the interface that Lena and I have had. So we'll do a bit of a mishmash of both, but I think the applying lessons from early psychosis is a bit more direct and a bit more salient for, for the purpose of what I want to share today. And I'll start just you know, by, by telling you a little bit about where I'm coming from. We'll talk a little bit about some key concepts that I've tried to integrate into the work I've done. And then we'll spend a fair bit of time applying these concepts to psychosis in different ways, ranging from neurobiology to um, uh, sort of conceptual frameworks to service structures, OK? Um, and then we'll see if we can expand the conversation a little bit to thinking about broader models and implications. All right. So, um, OK, I'm just going to, OK, there we go. So, so you know, a fundamental motivation, oh, there we go. So a fundamental motivation for me um, and, and kind of what has been a starting point in a lot of ways, uh, given my background that Lynn identified. So I, I've got a background in health policy, and so I've you know, often thought about health services. I'm a, I'm a physician, so I, I'm a practitioner in that sense, and I think a lot about service design um, and how people come into care or how they transition through care, how they transition out of care. And with respect to sort of youth mental health and early psychosis, which is kind of the piece of interest to me, there's this general kind of approach, which is that we start on the left here with what we call undifferentiated mental health difficulties. And then we've got this stuff on the right, which is you've got a range of categorical discrete diagnoses. And what is, you know, some effort has been put into, but we still have a long way to go is this piece in the middle, which is how do people get from the left hand of the screen to the right hand of the screen in terms of both um, their illness onset, even the risk of the, 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 the early course of illness um, and the evolution of the illness and, and its facets, as well as kind of what we as a social system can put into place to try to support or ameliorate some of those difficulties. And, and really, as far as we've gotten these days, um, there, there's a lot of work, obviously, in neurobiology and other things. But, but in, in broad strokes, right, what we're talking about to go from the left to the right is increasing severity, distress, some differentiation, of course, um, and impaired functioning. And that, those are commonalities. But, but the details you know, still remain to be kind of figured out. Um, and um, you know, so, so these categorical approaches, and if you're a clinician, right, you're responding to presentations, not seeing the entire course of illness, because what you've got is the patient in front of you. Um, so you're responding to the person and that person's life course, but at a specific point along that life course. So it's kind of a snapshot approach. And even clinicians who appreciate development find, and this is a common you know, touchstone in conversations, that there is no there's not a lot of guidance. There's very little consistency in approach to things like early presentations, how we integrate assessments and analyses of risk and protective factors, how we conceptualize trajectories themselves and what trajectories might tell us about what is to come, prognosis and outcome. And then other pieces like what's the role of comorbidities? Um, and so, you know, in early psychosis, what we basically got is we take that dashed line in green away and we've got this arrow. Right. And, and, and I think most of us could agree that that is probably it's a nice start, but it's certainly insufficient um, for where we want to go as a field. And and if we think a little bit about what an individual's journey, um, both in terms of their journey into care, but also their their illness journey is they're encountering clinicians at, you know, 
certain points along the way and there are question marks about what's going on even if even you know in something that will eventually develop into a psychosis from the clinician's perspective they're focused on endpoints right like what are things like right now they're not they don't have the time and they don't necessarily have the frameworks to think centrally about development and, and that trajectory piece the continuity for of an ind, of an individual's course so those snapshots i showed that sometimes does not appear as continuity but appears as comorbidities because you combine those snapshots and you sometimes get differential or, or, or a set of different diagnoses at different time points it, it means that you know this this kind of this gap between the left and the right of the screen means that there's not a clear relationship between outcomes and the risk or protective factors that, that might connect with those. And then, of course, for poor, you know, there's not great predictive validity of early course for, for, for later course. And then you think about it, and, and this is especially relevant and important for youth and, and for young people, right? This is something that, you know, many of you are very familiar with. Um, youth is a period of neurobiological development, but also tremendous social development and the interaction between those two kind of dimensions. There are also shifts in, in um, not just sort of the wiring, but also the sorts of exposures that individual have and their perception. So you go almost from childhood mental phenomena to adult type mental phenomena, which are at some level distinct or at least different. Um, and this presents not just challenges, but it also presents opportunities, right? So if we can think about better providing support services and care for young people when they're in that critical period or window of the development of illness and the setting of trajectories, there's the possibility of really making big uh, improvements in, in, in things like resilience, um, reducing chronicity, reducing impairment or preventing impairment in the first place. And then getting more specific, we can think about things like, you know, opportunities to inform the selection of treatments, and even thinking bigger than that, thinking about how it might inform organizations of care or the de development and design of services themselves. So that's kind of, you know, maybe that I wanted to share that so that it sets the stage a little bit for, for the ways in which I think about some of these questions that I am to come. And then hopefully um, in keeping with Lena's request that I not uh, be poor, well, that I be well behaved, um, there won't be any surprises, um, you know, if I, if, uh, now that you, you've, you've been warned, so to speak, about, about my context and background, okay? So let's start talking about some of these concepts. And these are sort of key concepts. They're not complicated, but they are, I think, necessary to really, not necessarily beginning from a, a fresh sheet of paper, but in thinking about kind of what trajectory is all about. And so here's some of those concepts. You have these, you know, traditionally defined diagnoses on the right of the screen. And then this is an individual's illness trajectory, right? So what you have here is someone who started out with maybe some mild mood fluctuations early on, and over time, things developed into a classical bipolar disorder, okay? And what we might call that is sort of homotypic course or homotypic continuity. Things sort of, you know, are in the same realm. Maybe they get more severe at the point of diagnosis or near the point of diagnosis over time, but it's generally in the same ballpark. Then you have something a little bit different, which is heterotypy, right? So, um, so, so heterotypy might be something like you start out with with low grade depression or dysthymia, and then over time, what gets added onto, layered onto, or shifted into is anxiety in this case. And what we call this is heterotypic. So this is more heterotypic continuity, uh, which accompanies a transdiagnostic shift or um, accompaniment. Okay. And so, you know, these are the snapshots, right? So if you're, if you're thinking about homotypy, what you see is a pretty straightforward course of illness and the gradient in, in bipolar disorder with this homotypic course is that of severity. It just gets more severe over time, but is in the same kind of realm, ballpark, or dimension. With heterotypy, what you see is, is not just sort of the addition, but that the addition appears as comorbidities, right? So if you're looking at a, a dossier or a file of someone, you might see, well, anxiety, oh yeah, but earlier on they had sort of some low-grade depression. And the question I think that, that this raises is from the individual's perspective and from the perspective of a life course, 
is this actually something different? Is this an addition or is this actually that person's trajectory of illness, which started out uh, as one, but then that evolved into something else, okay? And that's not just an evolution in severity, it's actually an evolution in content as well. And, you know, even recently, there's been some lovely work on this um, and the question of comorbidity, it's become extremely clear that comorbidity is not just common, but, but um, pervasive. So, so here's some lovely work from John McGrath's group. So he has, you know, one of these sort of um, data sets that can make people jealous. Uh, Danish case registries, this is, you know, 6 million people kind of thing. And this is a clinically defined sample. And what you see here is that no matter, well, for anyone who have, if it's a clinically defined sample, these are individuals who have a diagnosis. The point being that once you have a diagnosis, you have increased risk for any other diagnosis, okay? And that's true for any initial diagnosis. So you have increased risk for all disorders with any prior disorder. And, that, and what you see from the orange to the blue is that this remains true even when adjusting for confounds like age, sex, and specific prior disorders. This lovely work. I've said lifetime comorbidity uh, on the title here, on the, the header of the slide, but actually it's lifetime comorbidity, which persists for up to 15 years, but actually it's not, you know, um, it's not distributed in a standard fashion over time. The risk is actually highest in the first six months after the initial diagnosis. And this is this, the, 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 the uh, figure is for mood disorders, but there are similar patterns for other pairs of disorders. This is one of these beautiful screenshots or, uh, or figures that you look at it and you immediately sort of get the point. It's a Sankey diagram. Um, any prior disorder you can see distributes into all sorts of later disorders. So wherever you start on the left, you can see lots of different paths. So there is a lot of comorbidity. There's a lot of heterotypic continuity. So that's sort of concept one. Concept two, right, is, is, is linked, but not entirely the same. And that is this notion of pluripotentiality. And this is a concept that has sort of crept into the literature. I mean, it's been there for a long time, but it's become more um, of kind of touchstone, especially in youth mental health and certainly in psychosis. And so the black lines here are what we've talked about before, homotypic on the bottom, continuity on the top. But what you see with fluid potentiality is you see similar starting points in the green, but ending at different points later on. So the course chain, the course is similar at the beginning, but there's lots of possibilities later on. So that's pluripotentiality. Here's a third example of someone who might start with sort of mood fluctuations but ends up with a psychotic disorder. Okay, and again, lots of, um, lots of recent examples of this. Again, really interesting studies. This is work from Absalom Caspi and Terry Moffitt's Dunedin study, uh, you know, just over a thousand individuals in a town in New Zealand. And they've raised the question not as, as a competitive one, but they raised the point, I suppose, that the Danish data that I presented just a moment ago is a clinical sample, right? It's pre-selected for, for clinical diagnoses. But what if you take, is it possible that, that, that the Danish data is because the sample has been pre-selected? What if you take um, an entire population of a town? And so this is a population-based birth cohort study that's been followed for over 40 years. Many of you will have, have come across some of the work. Um, and, and the point here is that age of onset is pretty, you know, below the age of 25 for kind of the majority of individuals. And the earlier, the first diagnosis, the, the greater number of types of mental disorders one is likely to have over life. So earlier onset means more comorbidity and more diverse comorbidity as well, All right? Another, this is again from that same paper of Absalom's, um, so, you know, another lovely Sankey diagram, I mean, you just see there's so much heterotypy, so much pluripotentiality from the starting point, and then it just fragments pretty quickly. Um, and so, and that's true both in the, in the subset who received inpatient care, as well as the full cohort of over a thousand people, right? So 85% of those who by age 45 had had a disorder um, had also had one or more comorbidity. That's, that's, you know, a pretty substantial number. So, 
Okay, so we talked about continuity, heterotypic, homotypic, we've talked about pluripotentiality, and then there's this notion of convergence, right? So the idea here, in a sense, it's, it's, diff it's quite different from pluripotentiality. The idea here, oops, is that you have, um, somehow uh, one of the arrows has been lost, but the idea is you can start with different places, at different places on the left-hand side, and converge like the two bipolar, or the two or three arrows with bipolar disorder do, they all started at different points, but they all ended up at the same uh, end point in sort of adult stable disorders. So let's, those are some key concepts that I've been thinking about how best to apply to psychosis. Why don't I pause here um, and see if there are any questions or thoughts on the concept so far. Uh, and we'll 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 think a little bit now. You know, once we we go through some of those, we can spend a bit of time thinking about how those apply to early psychosis in particular. Lena, I can't see, but are there questions that have been typed into the text, or we can open it up for anyone who wants to ask? Yeah, there, there's no chat questions. Uh, but you know, one thing that came to my mind, uh, Jay, is uh, with with what you're talking about. The pluripotentiality is not just a, a pre-psychotic phenomena, right? There will be some uh, shifts in diagnosis even after the end point of a single diagnosis being made. I think that's the point you uh, already labored upon, but just want to clarify if, if that's what you meant. Pre-first episode. Yeah. But, but you can have, you know, potential pluripotential potential even after that point, mm. right? Is that is that kind of what you were getting at? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, sorry, uh, it's last for a minute, Jay. Uh, oh, sorry, did you lose me for a minute? Uh, yeah, no, my internet is unstable, but it, okay. I, I got the point. So it's not a end point. The pluripotentiality continues, I guess, even after. Right, that. right. And I was, I was just using the example of early psychosis because it's one in which we are sort of talking about this in general these days. But also, it may be a relevance to those who are coming from PEP, for example. Yeah. Thanks. Are there other questions, thoughts? I have a, a quick question, actually. Um, so the lines um, obviously are, are one dimensional, but um, and you, you look at like switching diseases over time, but can you have like the line splitting into two and, and have sort of depression and bipolar and psychosis all going on at the exact same time? Or is, it, is there always this, this shift between? Right. So that, that raises a few different questions, right? And I think it's a really salient comment. So um, so you can absolutely have multiple diagnoses at the same time, right? Those would be sort of comorbidities. A classic example is, you know, I didn't add substance use disorder here on the right hand side, but that happens So that can certainly happen. You can have kind of arriving to just reify the same organizing structure we already have. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Jay. If you want to move on. Yeah, sure. I was just going to ask Peter. Does that does, does Peter feel like um, I sort of addressed what you were getting? Yeah, I think so. Thank you. All right, super. So I'll keep going, and there'll you know there'll be other opportunities to to. Um, discuss and, and engage about some of this. So, so, so that's what 
a lot of the work my group and, and my collaborators have tried to, to do over the last few years. And this is, I'm, I'm really pleased to present this today because this is work that, you know, sort of relies very much on um, an instrument pioneered and developed by Ross Norman. Um, I don't know if Ross is here today, but Ross was foundational to PEP London and Ashok Mala who is now in Montreal, but, but uh, the two of them really, really uh, built Pep London together. And so I just wanted to you know, give a nod to that, that tradition and, and history. Um, so, okay, the, the, you know, one of the things that infuriates many of us um, is, is, you know, and, and develop, causes a lot of frustration is this notion of really tortuous and complex pathways to care. And here's a good example. The details don't matter. The point being that someone has non-psychotic symptoms. Eventually they develop a psychosis and get sent to the right place to treat an, a first episode psychosis. But there are so many twists and turns and delays and, and dead ends and roadblocks along the way, right? So that's, and that's along with that kind of, you know, variable trajectory of illness, because sometimes it does not present as a clear-cut psychosis. Sometimes it is not, especially in the earliest stages of clear-cut psychosis. So there are heterotypic or transdiagnostic shifts. There are heter there's heterotypic continuity. And that really, we, we don't have a system that is necessarily built to accommodate that, right? It's just a series of presentations and banging your head against the wall or banging your head uh, against the wall as an adult or, or a young person en route to finding the right place to, to help you. Um, and, you know, I, I um, can't um, forego giving a presentation without maybe taking a bit of a dig at DSM, which, of course, we rely on all the time, um, but, but there certainly is a role here that categorization of the categorical formation of mental disorders has played a role in the challenges that the system presents us with. I picked this slide in particular. It actually looks like the DSM is levitating, um, but I think very appropriately, the gentleman uh, behind it is quite frustrated and cross with the DSM. So I think it captures a lot of the halo effect or the halo around the DSM and the rapturization, but also the, the to it. All right. So let's talk a little bit about those concepts as, and it's an application of those concepts to schizophrenia and psychosis. So let's let's situate the next little section in that. And, and really what I want to focus on is the early psychosis, well, kind of the structure and function of early psychosis services, but the the, the organization of knowledge around early psychosis is kind of a, a flagship program as well. And, and the point or kind of the starting argument I want to make here is that in building early psychosis services, many such services, not all, but many such services sort of started with a framework that was rooted in schizophrenia as kind of the prototypical form of illness. And then if you sort of work backward and say, okay, well, what comes before that as an opportunity for early intervention? Many places sort of said, okay, well, what comes before that is sort of the first episode of psychosis. Well, what comes before that? Well, it's the clinical high-risk phase, okay? And that has been a useful framework or scaffolding or approach. It's been tremendously useful. It has permitted all sorts of innovation in service design. It has certainly shed light on neurobiology and Lena is a wonderful example of someone who, who has contributed to that. Um, but the argument I wanna make here, and this is kind of fundamental or foundational to the talk, is that this approach or framework or conceptualization of early psychosis, whether it's first episode or clinical high risk phases, comes with a core assumption that might be understandable, might be useful, but does need to be unpacked and critiqued if we are going to advance the field further. And the assumptions, the assumption or the, the core set of assumptions are this. If we're starting from schizophrenia as this prototypical form of illness, and we want to develop services or conceptual frameworks earlier for earlier stages or phases, then what, what, what has come with that is this notion that later stages are purer versions or more distilled versions of the earlier stages or conversely, that earlier stages are milder forms of later stages. Okay? And, and people like Robin Murray and, and Jim Van Oss have certainly made that argument very, very cogently. 
The other implication of this from the perspective of illness course is that it means that anyone who's developed, for example, a first, well, a, a, who's developed schizophrenia must have passed through a first episode phase, okay? And in some ways that I think is tautological. I mean, it's, it's, it's true, but, but go even further back. It also comes with an assumption that anyone who develops a first episode of psychosis must have passed through a clinical high-risk phase or a phase of subthreshold psychotic symptoms. And the assumption there is an assumption of homotypy, okay? Um, and, and I felt for a long time, and, and I'm fortunate in that sort of where I landed here at PEP had a data set that I could unpack to really think a little bit about this. And it's a data set that's been painstakingly collected as, I, as I'll share with you. So what we're talking about here, right? We have these threshold level kind of diagnostic entities on the right-hand side. We have this clinical high-risk state um, and undifferentiated mental health difficulties on the left. And, and really what we've done is we've paired this, um, they're at the same kind of, you know, they're on the same level, but just differentiated by gradient of severity. That's really what homotypy is. Um, and the blue square implies that, is meant to imply that we've also structured services in a manner that, that pairs those things nicely. So this really emphasizes, right, homotypic continuity. It ignores uh, the potential for pluripotentiality. Potential pluripotentiality is probably you know, something I should change in the slides. Gene Addington um, and or Simon and others have, have really demonstrated this very nicely that individuals who come in with a clinical high-risk state go on to develop psychosis actually relatively infrequently, far more frequently they'll go on to develop depressive disorders, anxiety disorders, substance use disorders, and other comorbidities. And, and so that's what this really is, right? That's pluripotentiality. Um, if we're just adopting pluripotentiality within the current diagnostic system. Uh, and Lena, you made the point that that could be adopted in other ways too. But, but the, the piece it ignores is a question of things like convergence, right? So, so um, is it possible that other, there are other routes to a first episode of psychosis? Um, and this matters um, for a lot of reasons. So here's another way to put it. Clinical high-risk infrastructures emerged in relationship to first episode psychosis infrastructures. There has been a lot of recent investments. Like this has really caught fire. NIMH in the US just put $75 million on the table for this. And um, in Montreal, we're fortunate to be part of the PRONET um, consortium, which is led by Scott Woods at Yale, which is sort of one of the sites in, in, in the 26 site network uh, to this effect. Um, but, but that is, you know, this paradigm has received a lot of investment. The question I guess I'm trying to raise here is, is this the right way or the sole way to think about trajectory and illness course? It's valuable, but there may be other ways to think about this. And to really problematize this, is first episode psychosis always preceded by a clinical high-risk state? And, and until recently, we've not had an answer to that. And you see this kind of assumption kind of showing up in all sorts of places. This is a classic, um, you know, meta-analysis by Paolo Fisarpoli, in which in the red here, you see first episode psychosis, but you see a brief limited symptoms and attenuated psychosis syndrome and basic symptoms as being kind of in the same, um, you know, conceptual framework. And, and that fosters or propagates this notion that um, these are milder forms of the full-blown first episode psychosis. I'll put it a different way one more time. And these, I'm, I'm approaching this from different ways, just in case, you know, people think in different ways, hopefully it'll give you different ways to grab onto the concept. The current, um, you know, thinking, if you have 100 individuals who have a clinical high-risk state with sub-threshold psychotic symptoms, about a third of them, according to Paolo's 2013 meta-analysis, the number would actually be lower today, and that's a whole other conversation which we could maybe talk about towards the end, but, but let's say a third of them develop a first episode of psychosis. But what I'm asking is actually something different. What I'm saying is, if there are 100 individuals who have a first episode of psychosis, how many of them came via a clinical high-risk state of subthreshold psychotic symptoms, as opposed to anxiety, depression, substance use disorders, and other things without evidence of an identifiable subthreshold psychotic syndrome prior to the first episode. And we just, we haven't known until recently, or we haven't had any clues until recently. Why does this matter? Um, it matters, you know, because it'll tell us about what proportion of first episode cases could even be targeted through clinical high-risk infrastructures. To make that really concrete, 
if the answer is 95% of first episode cases came via a clinical high-risk state, then you'd be justified in arguing that most of your eggs should be in the basket of prevention through clinical high-risk services or uh, services targeting the clinical high-risk state, interventions targeting the high-risk state. On the other hand, if 10% or 20% or even 30% of first episode cases at the other extreme um, came via a clinical high-risk state, then you'd need to, you know, I think it would be fair to argue that the, the kinds of interventions you should think about for detection uh, and, and treatment or secondary prevention might need to be thought about quite differently, right? And so it's about a prioritization of resources and energy and effort and the feasibility and planning of early intervention efforts. Okay. Um, and of course, you know, the clinical high risk state, of course, is important to think about in part because it is a key site for delaying or preventing conversion to psychosis. It does, legitimately does confer a higher risk of psychosis compared to the general population. Um, one thing to note, of course, again, with this link between first episode and clinical high risk is that the interventions in clinical high risk are often organized around lower grade psychotic symptoms. So CBT, for example, or earlier on um, low dose antipsychotic medications, that's not done as much anymore as many of you know, versus kind of what we have now come to see as a reality, which is very protein fluctuating syndromes that, that evolve a fair bit week to week. Um, even though the reason the person is admitted to the program or the service is because of a subthreshold syndrome or a clinical high risk syndrome. Just to note, um, conversion rates, as I said earlier, have declined over the past decade. Most people do not develop psychosis and, and a ton develop non-psychotic disorders. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about some of our group, PEP Montreal's investigations in this. And this is, uh, many of you who are familiar with PEP London will be familiar with this. This is uh, uh, an infrastructure that was established by Ashok Mala in 2003 and has continued to this day young people aged 14 to 35 with the first episode of psychosis. We exist in a catchment-based area. There's no competing first episode or early intervention services in the area, either public or private. Um, and so in theory, at least, and I saw Kelly Anderson just joined recently, so I should give a nod to the fact that Kelly has very rightly pointed out that not everyone with the first episode of psychosis actually gets the care that they deserve and need. But what we can perhaps say is everyone who is identified as needing um, early intervention for psychosis by a health practitioner, um, or most everyone, uh, because of outreach work, et cetera, um, eventually could make their way to PEP. And so you know, we've done evolving early case identification efforts. We've got an open referral system. We've got flexible, rapid assessments, et cetera. For this data set, we used the circumstances of onset and relapse schedule, which, as I mentioned before, was pioneered by, by Ross Norman and Ashok Mala, um, which consists of really detailed interviews with patients and carers, all available medical, educational, and other health records. And from there, from those are extracted data on early signs and symptoms and pathways to care, including key metrics like DUP, help seeking, early changes in behavior. And then you can pair that, of course, with longitudinal assessment. Um, of how someone does when receiving services. Within the cores, there's a topography of the psychotic episode, which is another instrument flag, um, focusing on uh, nearly 30 early signs and symptoms that predate the psychosis. So this is all prior to the date of onset. It's derived from uh, a German instrument pioneered by Hans Hafner, which had over 100 symptoms. So it's sort of distilled and simplified a little bit. We've done lots of training and inter-rater reliability here at PEP. And all of this is sort of decided on at a consensus meeting chaired by a research psychiatrist. So the analyses I'm gonna present in a moment are for the first 300, well, not the first, but 351 subjects who completed the TOPE and the cores. Now, of course, um, those of you who are familiar with the field will know that once you've hit a first episode of psychosis, then you're looking back, right? To see, did someone have a clinical high risk state or not? And there are not, very many instruments, and there's only one or two in which you can actually do that. And I was fortunate that, that the cores and the tote together uh, are one of those. And so as a, as a first cut, what we did is we approached you know, 30 or more experts uh, who have real you know, experience with early intervention psychosis internationally, anonymously said, okay, we'll ask them 
which of those you know, nearly 30 signs and symptoms would constitute attenuated or positive subthreshold psychotic symptoms if they appeared at a time before the individual met criteria for a syndromal level psychotic episode, meaning before the first episode of psychosis. And a priori, we said, you know, for any of these you know, 27 symptoms and signs, if 60% of or more of the respondents to the survey say yes, then that we will say that that was a subthreshold psychotic symptom. So it's different from the SIPs or the CARMs uh, for those who are familiar with it, in part because we're looking retrospectively with the caveats that come with that, of course. Um, okay, so um, just to cut to the chase here, here's that list of signs and symptoms and in bold and underlined are the list of nine, which ended up being sort of counting as subthreshold psychotic symptoms. Suspiciousness, odd, bizarre ideas, not delusions, odd or unusual eccentric behavior, uh, unusual perceptual experiences, disorganized non-speech, inappropriate affect, hallucinations, delusions, and passivity experiences, okay? So the percentages are the percentages here of the numbers of individuals who experienced those prior, out of the 351 prior to the onset of first episode psychosis. These are not the, you know, did 60 or more. These are not, so some of these are rarer, um, but still 60 or more percent of the experts felt that this would have counted as a subthreshold symptom or sign. Again, to cut to the chase, what we found is that about two thirds of the first episode population had identifiable evidence of a subthreshold psychotic syndrome prior to the onset of psychosis, of first episode psychosis, which means that about a third didn't. And that's, you know, that it's an interesting kind of you know, result because what it points to is that, you know, the clinical high risk state is probably worth paying a lot of attention to but there are potentially other pre-psychotic states that are also worth paying some attention to if we truly want to aim prevention at you know, anyone who's potentially at risk. Okay, so let's, um, let's, let's move along here and we're gonna apply some of these concepts now. And, and I'll tell you a little bit about how my group has sort of taken some of that work forward. So that was the initial finding. This is, as, as you may remember, this sort of the point we made about convergence, that there's all sorts of pathways, not just the homotypic pathway to first episode psychosis. Um, another question we can examine with this data set is, is um, to tackle, or at least contribute to tackling this notion of whether psychosis um, is distinct as a mental disorder, or if it exists on the same continuum with common mental disorders, right? And there's been a long tradition of considering psychosis as distinct uh, in origin or type, but others, such as Jim Van Oss, probably most strikingly, have made the point really well that psychosis, there's evidence too that psychosis may be all along the same continuum, perhaps at an end of the continuum, but still on the same continuum as common mental disorders. And some of the evidence he, that he produced, you know, frequent subclinical psychotic experiences and subthreshold syndromes in the general population, despite, you know, even if we're discounting help seeking, um, psychotic experiences are associated with adverse outcomes of different forms, even if they don't, even if those individuals don't go on to develop a, a psychotic disorder. And non-psychotic disorders in those with subthreshold psychotic syndromes are, are quite frequent. So all of these sort of suggest, you know, some continuity in structure. Um, most of this work has studied general population samples. And so we thought more recently that critical evidence for this or complementary evidence could, for this could come from what we call these follow-back studies, uh, like the sort that Hafner had pioneered and that the cores and the tope also sort of represent. And, Really, the question we wanted to ask here is, is what evidence can we produce about homotypy versus heterotypy? And so again, this catchment-based sample. And what we found is that the first psychiatric symptom in um, individuals in our first episode sample, 80, for 86% 86 of individuals, the first symptom was a non-psychotic symptom. And you know that 100% of these individuals go on to develop a first episode of psychosis, right, by definition but the vast majority of them had a non-psychotic symptom or sign first. Um, and that might've been an outpost symptom, but when it comes to the prodrome, meaning the continuous period of symptoms prior to a first episode of psychosis, still you know, more than a majority um, developed uh, psychosis after a first prodromal symptom characterized as non-psychotic. Um, and the, then the point being, if these non-psychotic symptoms are occurring earlier, 
then some threshold psychotic symptoms must be occurring more proximal to the first episode of psychosis. Some of the stuff from, you know, from, from the paper, and this is uh, published earlier this year in Schizophrenia Bulletin, um, and there was a really actually a, well, a thoughtful um, editorial by Jim Van Oss that um, really flagged the importance of follow-back methodology to answering questions that other methods cannot. Um, but just to, just to point out here, you know, you can see there's a bit of a long tail um, for non-psychotic symptoms, um, but the distribution of subthreshold psychotic symptoms in that population is somewhat different. When you combine this, what you see is that those who had subthreshold psychotic symptoms had more non-psychotic symptoms. Okay, um, so the point being, subthreshold psychotic symptoms prior to a first episode seem to occur on a bed of non-psychotic symptoms, or at least sort of um, frequently so. This is a really cool spider plot with depression um, kind of as symptom one, and one to 18 are non-psychotic symptoms, and A to I are the subthreshold psychotic symptoms. The key point I want to make here is that, and the yellow, by the way, is those who had had subthreshold psychotic symptoms at one point or another. The brown color is those who had never had subthreshold psychotic symptoms prior to their first episode. Point I want to make here is that for every non-psychotic symptom, as well as every subthreshold psychotic symptom, those who had had subthreshold psychotic symptoms had the non-psychotic symptoms more frequently as well. Okay. And looking here, basically, as you have more non-psychotic symptoms, you have more subthreshold psychotic symptoms. So again, sort of just some, just a few different bits of evidence pointing using the same data I said pointing to this notion or supporting the Van Oss argument that um, psychotic disorders emerge from, and at this early stage when you might have better access to recollection with the caveats that come with it, still um, may clearly seem to come or, or emerge from a bed of non-psychotic symptoms. Okay, continuing on, there's some implications for service organization. Here is that homotypic setup that we've talked about, the convergence. Um, but if we take this kind of homotypic, you know, the standard homotypic kind of framework for designing services and linking them up together, then what we're going to be left with is the same kind of diagnostic silos that we are complaining about in the first place. And Peter, this is um, kind of, you know, a, a further comment maybe in relation to your earlier question there. But, um, you know, if there is, I want to make another argument that sort of extends our, our initial work. If there is convergence, and if we're combining that with the notion of pluripotentiality, which we know about, then what you've got is something more like this. And it does raise the question of whether the blue boxes here, each of these blue boxes makes sense, right? Are we better off adhering to the same diagnostic silos and just building continua of services within those diagnostic silos? Or more uh, radically, are we better off actually building earliest stage services, so subthreshold services, recognizing the fluidity of those syndromes that combine um, sort of a range of syndromes. And we still might have centers of excellence for first episode psychosis, early onset bipolar disorder, et cetera. But um, would this be a more appropriate configuration or design of services given what we see in young people? So that, you know, just a demonstration of implications for services. We looked at clinical outcomes as well, right? Um, asking whether those who had subthreshold psychotic symptoms before a first episode versus those who didn't have subthreshold psychotic symptoms before a first episode have different longitudinal outcomes. And that matters for the feasibility and planning of early intervention services. So this is work by um, a master's student uh, of myself and Martin Lepage, my colleague and friend here. Um, Rachel Rosengard is now a med student at Cornell. So she looked at these two subgroups at the point of intake no differences, right, in non-effective or effective psychosis in social demographics. No differences even in baseline symptomatology or functioning as measured by positive symptoms, negative symptoms, depression, anxiety, gap, or, or so forth. So again, at the point of first episode intake. But where you see the differences emerging are at a year. So this is fascinating. Positive symptoms at baseline seem the same between these two subgroups, negative symptoms as well. But at one year, those who had positive symptoms or who had subthreshold psychotic symptoms prior to their first episode appear to do worse in positive and negative symptoms a year later. That same thing does not hold true for depression or anxiety. 
Those are constant between the two subgroups. They, of course, improve over time, but not differentially. And functioning, you do see these differences emerging again at one year. And so I just, what I want to flag here is, is something I alluded to earlier, which is that, that notion that psychotic experiences, as Jim Van Oss has demonstrated, may have long-term sequelae. Or um, to quote Alison Jung, who always has these real killer lines, um, this is sort of evidence of the long burn of psychosis, right? Um, that really has an impact. So we looked at other outcomes. Medication adherence seems to be, uh, this is uh, Jean de Verdano, a psychiatrist um, who's with me for a little while. Uh, medication, antipsychotic medication adherence seems to be poor in, over time in those with subthreshold psychotic syndromes prior to a first episode. And there are implications for care pathways as well. You've seen this figure before. Um, a master's student who's now moved on to a PhD, Sarah McElwain, um, has started looking at some of the treatment delays and help seeking features in our two subpopulations. And it looks like um, the length of the prodrome and the DUP, the total DUP, seem to be substantially longer in those who had subthreshold psychotic symptoms prior to a first episode. And if there are questions about that, we can maybe spend a bit of time when I take a break in just a moment. All right, and then a little bit of neurobiology. Lena, I think you're familiar with this paper. Um, it appeared in a journal for which you're an associate editor, um, just showing that there may be differences in, in cortical thickness between our two subgroups. We started looking at cortisol blunting under the Trier social stress task. And in this case, it's interesting because there's no difference between uh, those you know, who came via the different pathways to a first episode, but those groups in totality are uh, different from healthy controls. Okay, and there's no difference between first episode as a whole and clinical high risk as a whole in cortisol blunting. So the point I want to make here is that this is an example, and the cortical thickness example in the slide prior, it's that some biomarkers may diverge at different stages. All right, let me take a pause here before we get into the part broadly about clinical staging. Um, and other models to, to think about illness course. Any thoughts, questions? So uh, th there is a question in the chat box, Jay. This is uh, perhaps more technical, but maybe you can uh, share sure. some thoughts before you proceed. So, you know, you raised an important issue on uh, how do we count the number of people uh, who went through the CHR stage before they became psychotic. Um, you know, you looked at the percentages, uh, the differences. Is there any other uh, more nuanced quantitative ways of answering this question? The, the question seems to be important. Uh, do people go through the CHR stage and how many and do they vary yeah. across different places? That's a lovely question. Thank you. So, so uh, you know, I agree that it's an important question. I also agree that the way we looked at it is not the perfect way to look at it. So other people have looked at this in other ways. Um, Ajna Kina, I think in BMC Psychiatry and Paolo Fieser Poli in JAMA Psychiatry have all both looked at this in the SLAM, so the South London data set. But what they did was they looked at this in the context of how many individuals in their first episode treatment sample had been flagged as having an at-risk mental state in the clinical records prior to that first episode. And the figure they came up with was four or five percent. Now, sometimes individuals or sometimes people have commented to me that, well, that's quite a bit of difference. But I, I, I would just make the argument that those are actually different concepts. So what, what we have identified is sort of the psychopathology. What Paolo and Ajnakina have identified is sort of the clinical reach of services. So their four or five percent may be very different if you know there was better um, popularization or better promotion of at-risk mental state services in GP clinics, for example. So, uh, so, so that's one way that's been looked at it. Of course, the, you know, the gold standard would be something like some kind of digital study in which you could ask via whether it's experience sampling or just having you know, some uh, kind of an angel on someone's shoulder, asking every few minutes if someone's experiencing subthreshold psychotic symptoms, and, and then in that general population sample, which would have to be a big sample, you'd see who develops first episode psychosis, and then you have your new 
numerator and, and denominator. But for obvious reasons, um, including cost, time course, sample size, et cetera, that's, that's not practical. So, so I, I'm not, I mean, I thought about this a lot. I'm not sure other than through follow back studies in which you at least have, you know, a good sense of what the, sam the, the sample you're ultimately interested in is, which is the first episode sample. I'm not sure there is a better way to do this, at least with technology being as it is right now. Is it perfect though? By no means. Right. Thanks for that. Are there other questions, uh, Lena or anyone else? Um, that's it for now, Jay. So if you continue, we can uh, bring up some sure. questions at the end. Yeah. Yeah, perfect, perfect. Um, uh, let me just add a little bit to the last question, right? One of the challenges with retrospective or, or follow-back sampling um, is that it relies on retrospective data collection. Um, and, you know, I certainly don't remember things perfectly um, after the fact um, when I'm asked, and most people don't. Uh, in, in applying the cores, what we've tried to do is, is you know, anchor um time points in key bits and pieces that people would remember so we have sort of if someone says well when i was eight this happened or when i was 13 this happened we would we have a standardized way of recording that so if they say when i was 13 we would pick their 13th birthday or if they say when i was in ninth grade then we would have a standard way of documenting what the date of grade nine would be and we'd of course probe further to you know see if there are additional anchor points but, but you can imagine that this is, it's an imperfect art. So I hope that um, fleshes out part of the question a little bit more as well. So let me, okay, so let's, let's see if we can sort of take a step back here. So we've applied some of these concepts to psychosis. And then let's, I want to, I want to, um, you know, this slide you've seen a few times, this is the psychopathology piece, and this is the service infrastructure piece, and this is the pluripotentiality and the convergence and thinking all about kind of what sorts of service configurations could work, right? And, and this is a very live conversation um, in, in sort of bodies, including um, there was a Lancet Commission on Global Mental Health, I think a year or two ago, there's another Lancet Mental Health or Lancet Psychiatry Commission on Youth Mental Health, which I've um, privileged to be a part of, and that's going to come out, I think, later this year, if not next year, um, in which sort of staging and, and other kind of illness mo illness development models have sort of you know, been really at the fore. Um, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about some of these. Okay, so let's, let's um, and, and when I say some of these, I mean, some of these ways of thinking about the questions that are on that the slide here that I'm showing now sort of produces, how do you, how do you think about how do you develop frameworks for uh, what we now know about the development of illness and how can you develop frameworks that foster kind of a continuum of services, right? That really meet the needs of youth as they emerge and evolve. And one example of that has been step care. Many of you have sort of heard a little bit about step care. Um, certainly in the youth mental health world, it's, it's, it's very prominent. Um, in the clinical high-risk world, it's very prominent. Um, SAMHSA, which is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service, I can't remember what the last A is for, in the U.S., they've asked clinical high-risk services to put together a step care model. Um, and really what step care is, is um, it's a way of organizing services, and in this case, mental health and substance abuse services, acknowledging limited resources so that the appropriate form and intensity of care are provided in response to an individual's needs. And some of the key principles here are that you want to provide the least intrusive or least invasive intervention earlier. And by earlier, I don't necessarily mean first, but for those with early stage needs or less acute needs. Um, but paired with that, there's certainly an argument consistently made that these early steps of care have a lower cost. So there's clearly a, a focus on resource efficiency and rationalizing care. Here's a nice conceptual kind of um, example here. So you have, you know, a population that's overall pretty well, and they receive relatively unintrusive services, advice and self-help resources. If you identify at-risk groups, you can you know, provide evidence-based alternatives to, so not face-to-face -face psychological services, but alternatives to that, whether those are groups or sort of bibliotherapy or whatever. Then in mild forms of mental illness, you have lower intensity services, digital and lower intensity face-to-face. -face, uh, and you start 
about psychological services. Then there are, you know, that's one step care model. Here's another step care model. Here's another step care model. Here's another step care model. And here's a Canadian step care model, which is pioneered by Peter Cornish, who was at, I think he's now at, at UC Berkeley. And this is very much aimed at a college or um, university population for which it's really gained a lot of traction. And you can see different steps as well as different construction of resources or types of resources around that. And what, you know, if you take a step back here, what you might take home from this is that, well, these are all step care models, but they're all actually quite different. And so we undertook um, a scoping review and we're undertaking a systematic review right now of um, step care models as they've been applied to youth mental health. And what we found is that these are clearly variably defined, they're variably organized, and they're also variably captured and measured. So, you know, just to take an example, many such models have two steps, many have three steps, a number have four steps, and a fewer have five steps. There's even one model that has nine steps. Um, and then when you look at the individual steps, there's actually great variety in what the steps, what constitutes the steps. So here's step one, in one K or in some, you know, in 18% was watchful waiting, but in 1% it was specialist and inpatient services, right? Um, and so what you see is that step one in one model is very different from step two in another model or from step one in a, in a different sort of model. And what I, what I would suggest is there may need to be some common language developed around uh, what, what, you know, what are the core components of a stepped care model? I'll shift gears a little bit to talk about clinical staging or kind of the service provision of clinical uh, service provision associated with that, which we might call stage care. And staging for those who are, um, you know, kind of involved in, in, in healthcare broadly is not new in mental health, right? It's actually a model that's been ported over from other areas of medicine or healthcare, most prominently cancer. So there's the tumor, uh, necrosis, metastasis, uh, sorry, not necrosis, the TNM model um, of staging, which has been prevalent in, in cancer for, for a long time. There are other forms of staging that have been deployed in diabetes, arthritis, and elsewhere. In mental health, actually back to the 90s, it was applied to depression, but really the momentum now is thinking about it transdiagnostically. So across a set of diagnoses without, like not within a particular diagnosis. And un, so you, one might argue that stepped care is really focused on the service and what the service has to provide. Whereas staging is a little bit different. Staging is focused on kind of determining the current presentation, determining where the individual is on a continuum of you know, ranging from wellness to illness. And so one might argue that it's less focused on sort of levels of care. It's more focused on locating the individual. And in doing so, you could argue that it's a bit more person-centric. What it does rely on, of course, is, is repeated outcome measures and assessments. And we're certainly not at a point where we know what those specific measures and assessments are. And of course, then, you know, one can think about overlaying notions of stage and trajectory with appropriate interventions. Here's a good example of that. This is work by Shane Cross and Ian Hickey uh, out of the University of Sydney that have really pushed um, the staging concept forward. Um, and so what you see here is different definitions of stages um, in, as you go to a higher stage, more complex, severe illness, time and intensity and cost of care. Fewer people will need it, assuming that the earlier stage interventions are helpful. And here is layering on the kinds of interventions that you might see, online interventions all the way to more specialized mental health services needed at later stages. Here's, this is uh, Jan Scott um, led this paper in the British Journal of Psychiatry, I think 2013, to starting to try to put some definition to stages, so stage zero, um, one, well, 1A, 1B, stage two, and then so on. And stage four at the bottom here is persistent or unremitting illness. Stage zero is actually no symptoms, but just increased risk, for example, uh, because of familial liability or vulnerability. Stage two is first episode. And so that distinction between stage 1B or stage one overall and stage two is critical. Stage two is really the first defined episode of a psychotic or a severe mood disorder. Okay, and, and on the right here, you see target populations being identified, interventions being identified. And so you can see that the concept is being fleshed out. Um, Dorian Neiman and I think Pat McGorry had sort of started thinking about this with relation to psychosis. And you see the same definitions of stages, but here you see that there's now a focus on early intervention and the, um, kind of the, the, the fact that 
different syndromes or types of symptoms or problems seem to occur quite frequently um, you know, across the board earlier on and perhaps are a little bit better defined as you go to higher stages. And then they integrated with that some thinking about uh, biomarkers as well. Jim Van Oss makes this point that you, know, you can start from relatively transdiagnostic symptoms like insomnia, which is common to a lot of late stage disorders, right? Um, but then it can take all sorts of different forms. So this is a really nice example of pluripotentiality starting with um, an individual symptom, which doesn't form a diagnosis, but over time and with higher stages, um, it can develop into more fully formed recognizable syndromes, or at least recognizable syndromes using our current diagnostic framework. And um, so in, in all of this, what you see is this need for continuity. You see the, the point about the point I was making earlier about homotypy versus heterotypy. You see the pluripotentiality, particularly in that last slide of Van Oss's. Um, and you see convergence, right? Um, this is a nice slide, Joanne Carpenter and Ian Hickey's group had put this together, which really has all of that. You see the transdiagnostic shifts here, for example, or here. You see the pluripotentiality at the earliest stages. Um, impaired sleep quality can you know, go all sorts of different directions. But Lena, to your question, you can have a severe de depressive episode, and that goes here, but it also goes you know, further to the left. Um, so you see pluripotentiality, you see convergence, you see transdiagnostic shifts, and you see the impact of this on all sorts of facets of life. So there may be comorbidities to take into account, social and occupational functioning, and the neurobiological piece as well. Um, Lena had mentioned at the introduction the transdiagnostic um, staging consensus statement that we put out last year. So this is just a table of that demonstrating how staging has been defined in recent models. Um, and we also argued that the, the definitions or the dimensions that have been articulated need to be developed further. And so examples of that are you know, substance use or suicidality or in the physical health realm, metabolic or autoimmune um, dimensions that would help us better understand trajectories of illness in a range of dimensions and develop a more sophisticated appreciation of, of, of how different markers, whether those be biological markers or other markers or indexes, indices, um, might combine together to help us define stages. And so um, this is kind of just the first page of that international consensus statement. Um, it's a real pleasure with Ian Hickey to be co-leading this, and, and we're trying to put together a working group on transdiagnostic staging in youth mental health. And really what we try to do here is to articulate key principles, uh, implications of, and how studies focused on staging should be operationalized if they're truly you know, going to harness the, the promise of the model. And this has now emerged as sort of a, a nice plank in mental health service reform, including the Lancet Commission that I mentioned before. A quick addendum, well, not an addendum, but a quick you know, bit that I really should say, which is that this is not the only transdiagnostic framework, right? I mentioned stage care, which is um, what I said just a moment ago, but step care, Claim, you know, is also potentially transdiagnostic. RDOC uh, is put forward by NIMH, also transdiagnostic, although has more of a research focus. And HITOP, which is the hierarchical topography of psychopathology, has done a lot recently, including in the latest issue of World Psychiatry, focusing on transdiagnostic um, phenomena and psychopathologies as well. And when what really pulls all of these together, what they all, all of these frameworks have in common is the notion of dimensionality, the, the need for a transdiagnostic shift in, in our appreciation of things and not just counting transdiagnostic shifts, but building models and frameworks that capture that. And at a kind of a fundamental level, an appreciation of development and illness course and longitudinal trajectory. So there are a lot of questions. I'm winding down a little bit now. There are a lot of questions about staging and what it could be. We need to think a lot about what dimensions there might be beyond just the standard symptoms functioning and cognition. I articulated some of what we had posited, um, but there may be more and I'd be delighted to chat about that. One of the key things that people are wrestling with is, you know, we've got these youth onset disorders, right? And that consensus statement was really focused on youth mental health, but there are also childhood onset syndromes. And how do those relate to youth onset uh, disorders? Are they separate tracks and unrelated? Or do we, for example, consider childhood onset disorders to be risk states for youth onset conditions. That at least provides the beginnings of connection. 
And then really the, the, what staging will be measured on at the end of the day is its clinical utility. And so can it produce genuine advances in clinical practice and service organization? And we you know the, the consensus statement was designed to at least put that you know, front and center, that that being the yardstick by which we should ultimately measure ourselves. And um, one of the things that I think, you know, it, this is sort of coming at the end of the talk, but it is fundamental to, to a lot of what I've said, certainly in the psychosis realm and staging, is that the staging model, for example, is being built or has to date been built without really good inclusion of multi-stakeholder input and the voice of those with lived experience. And that needs to change. And so what we're trying to do with that working group I mentioned before is also to bring in the voices of those who have sort of both our service users themselves and, and have lived experience as well. Okay, I can pause for a moment. This is the, the, the last slide before the acknowledgements, but I can pause for a moment if there are questions about um, the staging or step care elements, and then I can try and wrap up if that makes sense. There's not much in the chat box, uh, Jay. So if you wrap up, maybe we can open the floor. Yeah, then we can have a broader yeah. conversation. Sure. So, so I hope um, this is really, I mean, it is a wrap up in the true sense of the word. Um, I hope that I have conveyed um, to you all today that the current focus in like current frameworks and their focus on diagnostic, um, well, categorical diagnoses, discrete disorders, it really does not appreciate features that are especially relevant to child and youth mental health, things like heterotypy, things like pluripotentiality, convergence, et cetera. And these, the kind of the prominence of the current frameworks are contributing to, to blind spots, right? And it's really important to unpack and identify what those blind spots are because they have implications for so many other things. And my use of the work we've done in early psychosis was to sort of demonstrate how those assumptions that we are making because of the frameworks have produced blind spots and how one might go about unpacking those in sort of using multimodal data sets. Um, these are all, all those features, right, or the key concepts are all very common in youth. And so it's, that's particularly important during this developmental phase um, or that period, which, you know, Max Birchwood and others have identified already as a critical period or a critical window. There are newer alternatives or models that, that purport to, you know, change the ways in which we provide care or services uh, for that, that embraces longitudinal trajectories and illness course. Uh, and, but in order to do so, they need to capture those features. And, and we're certainly not at a point where that's happening reliably, nor do we know which features should be captured. And that's going to be an interesting area of work moving forward. And of course, that, you know, throughout, I've tried to point out that this has a number of implications, right? Not just for neurobiological research to take that classic example, but for the, you know, things like the organization of services and the kinds of you know, ways in which we offer clinical care as well. So in doing so, I hope that I've kind of, you know, done the clinician scientist thing, which is to pair um, sort of clinical observations in psychiatry. Of course, there's always the, you know, checkbox of appreciating phenomenology, uh, but also to demonstrate how research can inform Form clinical care, clinical care and clinical observations, like the fluidity of subthreshold symptoms or syndromes can influence research questions as well. And that, that becomes an iterative process. And, and that's certainly a lot. Both, both uh, I mentioned research quality council at access at PEP. Um, and, and other stakeholders who've been so central to, to some of this work and inspiring it, um, and to McGill and the Douglas. Thanks, everyone, for, for joining. Thank you, Jay. Uh, this was a fantastic uh, journey that you took us through, uh, very wide-reaching, starting from phenomenology to various stages of uh, not just psychosis, but you know, multiple mental disorders of importance. So thanks for uh, taking us through that. This, this was fantastic.
Um, if people have questions, you can either put it on the chat box or you can uh, use the raise hand function. Um, I'll be able to see because uh, the gallery is visible to me. So when people are thinking about this question, I, I, I thought I'll open it with, uh, with one observation I had, uh, Jay. Uh, you know, this is really playing a bit of a, a devil's... Sorry, Jay, my, my internet connection is unstable. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Am I audible, Jay? Can you hear me? I, I can hear you, but I... That's okay. I, I, my, you're having to... my, my internet is not great. So uh, the, the question I have is, you know, if you take the stance uh, that most mental illnesses, whether it's psychosis or bipolar disorder, all of them begin with some very nonspecific features. And most non-specific, most common non-specific feature being depression. And, and if you take the stance that depression is the, the default existential state of humans in some sense, does this really tell us anything about um, you know, how we should change the way we look at psychiatric disorders? Because the reason I'm asking you this is not is nothing special about psychosis or bipolar disorder. It could, it could be any physical illness could start with uh, a notable degree of depression. Take uh, cardiac disorders, for example, um, myocardial infarction. There's quite a lot of evidence that before MI, people show depressive state. So, so where does this lead us in terms of changing the way we identify at-risk syndromes and, and treat? The non-specificity adds a lot of complexity to managing the, the, the oncoming syndromes. What's your views on management? Okay, so so I'm gonna I'm gonna be very mechanistic, maybe or very simple in the way I start answering this question. It's a wonderful question, right? So um, and you know, these are these talks are also good opportunities to see questions that we can pick up at you know once we get back to having a beer at a conference or something like that. But um, so if that's the case, and I I'm saying all this you know to make sure that I'm following you know, the thread of the question as well. If that's the case, and I think there's an argument to be made for it then one of the things that seems really important to me is that an appreciation of um, affective, you know, the role of affective disturbances um, or mood should be built into um, a lot of different service infrastructures, whether those are in mental health or outside mental health in a way that is currently not happening, right? Um, so, so, for example, um, and I think this is relevant, many, and you know this, Lena, and others will know this as well, in the US, for example, many early psychosis infrastructures take only non-effective psychosis, right? So it's schizophrenia spectrum disorders. It does not take, uh, they do not take, they do not serve young people who have affective psychoses. Pep London was pioneering, actually, in that regard in that it, you know, as far as I understand, it had appreciated that in, in you know, in PEP Montreal, we, we sort of took, took um, PEP London's cue. Um, so, so that strikes me as actually really relevant because it, there are such fundamental shifts needed to take even that very basic point into account. There are such fundamental changes that need to be made at a really granular service mm -hmm. level to meet the very relevant point you're coming up with. Uh, I guess in, to put it in a nutshell, what I'm saying is there is still a lot of low hanging fruit um, to perhaps follow from your point. Yeah, uh, thanks for that, uh, Jay. I of course have uh, well, a lot of questions, but a question on how we change psychiatric training in the wake of what you said, but I'm gonna hold on to that for a minute because I see Peter Van Dicken rising his hand. He's a clinician scientist in training. So over to you, Peter. Thanks so much for the amazing talk, Dr. Shah. Um, I had a question about staging. Um, and one of the key differences I see between staging something like cancer and staging a mental health disorder is uh, your cancer stages are, are based very much on the pathology and the specific, yeah. um, um, I guess, physical manifestations. Uh, whereas obviously 
at least. Uh, it's still out on what we only does that. raise questions, right, about reliability and validity. Um, so I don't know if the, I guess what I'm saying there is that I don't know if we can a priori, you know, the fact that we are drawing lines arbitrarily in mental health means that whatever boundaries we set are invalid. Now, having said that, I think you're absolutely right that there's a fundamental distinction between staging as applied to oncology, for example, where they have, there are a couple of things, right? One is they have biomarkers, right? And, and the other is that in many ways, concepts like pluripotentiality don't hold in cancer. If you know what an early stage risk you know, state is, you probably have a pretty good idea of what endpoint you're trying to prevent. Right. And it, I'm not sure, given, you know, Lena's point, for example, a, a moment ago about depression being perhaps the starting point for many of these things. Um, do we know, given pluripotentiality, do we know sort of what narrow range of things we're aiming to prevent? And in cancer, you could argue that that's much more easily achievable. And therefore, you know what kind of range of treatments you should be thinking about, selecting, etc. We are not there yet. So at a most fundamental level, I think there's a question about whether um, the TNM you know, uh, structure of cancer staging has analogies in mental health. And if so, what would those analogies be? I would suspect that at the end of the day, if we are able to arrive at something, those will not be you know, sort of progression, extension, and then distal spread. Um, in the same way as has happened in cancer, we'll have to think actually quite creatively about what those dimensions are. And so it's a cool opportunity in a lot of ways to, to sort of think at on the ground floor about the ways in which we need to build um, conceptual frameworks that can then capture data to see if they're indeed valid. So test hypotheses, et cetera. It's a bit of a roundabout answer, but, but I hope that at least touches on some of kind of the very salient bits you, you brought up. Yeah, for sure. And I think that'll definitely be part of ongoing discussions moving forward. So thank you. Thanks, Jay. Uh, we have uh, Lawrence Jerome as an experienced uh, community practitioner in psychiatry. So he has some questions for you. Super. Hi, Jay. Very much enjoyed your talk. Very thought provoking. Uh, I'm a clinician working with ADHD through the lifespan, originally child psychiatry only, mm -hmm. but now right through the lifespan. Uh, I've been following the Dunedin data very carefully, and it's fascinating. And I'm aware that uh, they've got some very early predictors of people who later develop schizophrenic illnesses uh, that show up in childhood. But what I do as a clinician uh, is mainly work with kids and adolescents and adults with ADHD. And their story goes back to grade school or before. Uh, but they do have a lot of comorbidities, of course, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, quite challenging clinically. W we do know in our literature that sometimes when you treat ADHD, both in children and certainly in adolescents, uh, they may, you may actually uh, precipitate a bipolar mood disorder in the teens that really you weren't aware of before. Not so much in the kids, Although very occasionally you'll get a child who's got a classical ADHD syndrome and they start to hallucinate. So at that point, we usually stop the stimulants and uh, retake the family history to see if this right. is mitosis. But here's the question. I mean, we know from the, uh, the Scandinavian data that if you treat ADHD early, you're going to prevent a lot of later quotes unquote comorbidities, substance use, uh, you're going to reduce accident risk, driving problems, and the development and, and severity of later mood disorders. So there's an early intervention with ADHD that seems to be very helpful to do early. But I do worry that, you know, some of the non-specific ADHD symptoms that I'm treating early may actually be form proust of a, a psychosis, even though it's rare. And am I doing any harm by using stimulants? Definitely, we, will, we won't treat bipolar uh, and ADHD until we've stabilized the bipolar. But what about the schizophrenic uh, 
patients who may not really show much evidence other than ADHD? Are we doing any harm with them? Thanks for your question. So I assume what you're getting at is, are we doing any harm? You know, because the schizophrenia usually does not show up at the time that the ADHD presents itself or declares itself. No. Um, so I assume what you're referring to is sort of the, the, the use of you know, dopaminergic stimulants um, at a point at which um, you, know, you may not know much about, you may not know as much as you would like to about family history. You may not, you certainly won't know what the future will hold. And you know, I, I'm not a child psychiatrist, but but I guess what I would say is it 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 points to two things in my mind. One is it underscores the importance of kind of what I had said right at the beginning, which is an appreciation of longitudinal longitudinal trajectory, which is really about context. It underscores the appreciation of context more broadly in things like family history. Um, it also underscores um, you know the need for continuity of care. Uh, and so, you know, some of the ways in which we've set up the service structures, there's the classic piece about transition needing to happen at age 18, those sorts of things do, and, and if there are transitions early or so on, um, those sorts of things do get in the way of being able to sort of identify things early on when you see something a little bit potentially strange emerging. So all of that is, I guess, a bit of an argument for kind of not just early intervention, but the philosophy that early intervention uh, services try to embody, which is the sense of thinking broadly, thinking in a multidisciplinary care team approach, thinking about, you know, like you have an occupational therapist involved, you, have, you get a lot of different angles on an individual's life. And, and, and perhaps a simple beginning of a conversation on that would be to say that we need many more angles than we get just by kind of the, sing, you know, the standard psychiatric diagnostic system. Right? Thank you. Thanks, uh, Jay, for that. There's a, there's a question in the chat box. This is from uh, Kelly Anderson. Um, Kelly's thanking you for the great talk. And Hi, Kelly. Also, and she also asks you, um, where does substance use fit in the trans diagnostic framework? Do you conceptualize it as a comorbidity or is it another uh, you know, evolution, uh, an end state. So, so Kelly, that's like so fundamental, right? Like this question is so fundamental. And I think um, if I'm wearing my optimistic hat, I would say I'm feeling fairly optimistic today. So let me put on that hat just for a moment. Um, there are lots of conversations to be had about how those should fit in with the transdiagnostic framework. And we can talk about that in just a moment, but I'll switch to my skeptical hat, which is that, you know, Another way of looking at it is it's a bit of a black sheep. So we kind of conveniently ignore substance use disorders a lot of the time, in part because one of the assumptions of staging too, right? So staging is not immune to assumptions either. And one of the assumptions of staging that I think is unwritten and unexpressed, unarticulated sometimes is this sense, and I can, it was implicit in my slide, so I want to sort of attack it. Um, this notion that um, as later stages develop, there is this more like pure form or prototypical form of a disorder that everything distills into. When in fact, that is not the case. There is not simplicity in later stages. There's actually added complexity. And substance use is a fantastic example of a comorbidity that cuts across all sorts of diagnoses, uh, traditional diagnoses, um, but should be deeply integrated with all of those rather than being sort of, you know, told to sort of go away and show up another time or off on its own track. Like, I, I think that's a long way of, of kind of me complaining about a few things, but pointing out that we haven't, we haven't done right by substance use, I think, in the development of these models. And we need to actually pay far more attention to it because it's, it's an exemplar of a fundamental um, blind spot that the field as a whole has had. And you see that in early psychosis too, right? Many services, even that call themselves early psychosis services that won't see patients who have comorbid substance use disorders. And it just, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Thanks for I'm trying to behave well, Lena. <laughs> no, we should behave well as well. We can keep you for long. Uh, we're very interested in many questions that, that are raised by your talk, uh, but you know, we're aware of your time. Uh, so Jay, uh, 
uh, I, I'm, on, on behalf of everyone, let me thank you for this fantastic uh, talk and uh, patient answers for our questions. Just want to end with, uh, with a note of uh, uh, other important issues that your talk is, is bringing up. Uh, we need to rethink psychiatric training. Uh, there, oh, used to be, there used to be times when uh, we had textbooks giving very concrete examples of prototypical cases, and the training was based on them. Uh, you know, you get an idea of what schizophrenia is, what bipolar disorder is, and try to find those prototypes in your patients. But, you know, we cannot keep doing this now with, with all the emerging data that you and your mm -hmm. group is producing. So with that, uh, well, not so optimistic note, but, uh, but clearly a thoughtful note, I, I hope. Uh, I will uh, close this session and thank you very much, Jay, and, and please join me in uh, thanking and congratulating Jay for, for the fantastic talk. Thank you, Lena, and thanks everyone for joining. It was a great conversation, and I certainly agree on the, the revamping training piece. So, Thanks, everyone. We'll close this now. Thank you, Jay. <clears throat>